Chapter 19, Population Ecology. So a quick overview here. Population, as we should know, is a group of individuals of the same species or of a single species that happen to occupy a particular area or habitat at a particular time. So individuals in a population rely on the same resources, influenced by the same or similar environmental factors, and are likely to interbreed and interact with each other, making them a population of the same species. And their requirements are totally based on their biology, whether they're aquatic or terrestrial, etc. So population ecology is the science that focus on changes in population size, right? Numbers of individuals in a population, and the essential factors that regulate those populations over time. Many of those factors are biotic, like the food that animals may eat, and some of those factors are abiotic, like the temperature, for example, or available water, or um, minerals if you're a growing plant, for example, if we're talking about plants. So population ecologists describe a population in terms of its population size, meaning, again, the number of individuals, the age structure, which is pretty important. That's the proportion of individuals at different ages, whether they're juvenile, right, immature, or whether they're adults capable of breeding, mating, and then also density, how many individuals there are in a particular area, like a number of uh, wildebeests in a square mile or kilometer, or volume, like the number of fish in, a, say, in a, a cubic yard of water, that sort of thing. So population ecology, uh, ecologists in studying population dynamics, how populations change over time, right? They look at interactions between the biotic and abiotic factors that would cause changes in population sizes. So again, biotic factors are living things that influence population numbers, population dynamics. So for example, food that elephants would eat, uh, mussels, a type of um, uh, mollusk that sea stars would eat, those sorts of things. And then abiotic factors are non-living things that influence population numbers. So for a sea star, it would be the temperature of the water, how long the animals are exposed during low tide, those sorts of things, the salinity of the water for something that's terrestrial, it might be air temperature, um, things like rainfall, availability of water, uh, those sorts of things that are non-living that influence uh, an animal's life. So one important aspect of population dy dynamics is population growth, meaning how uh, fast the population might be growing or decreasing for example, and that's based on uh, reproduction of individuals. So population ecology also plays a key role in applied research in terms of being able to understand the biology of organisms, animals, whether they're animals or plants or bacteria, insects, whatever it might happen to be. So it provides critical information for conservation efforts and restoration projects. Uh, because uh, if you're trying to save something or rehabilitate a habitat, it's essential to understand the biology of the populations of organisms that live there. And then this, these information, this da these data are used to develop sustainable things like fisheries or forests in uh, uh, the lumber industry and are used to manage uh, wildlife populations. Because, for example, <clears throat> if there's a population of flamingos that appears stable, uh, it may appear stable because of population ecology work that has looked at the population numbers of uh, flamingos, how many flamingos might happen to be living in a particular area, and uh, things like density of flamingos, and how those numbers have changed over time. <clears throat> so studying population ecology of pests and pathogens is also important because that gives information in terms of how to possibly 
control the spread of pests or pathogens. If you're trying to fight pests or pathogens, it's essential to know their biology so you get an idea of how best to control them. So let's look at population density, number of individuals of a species in a particular area or volume of, say, water. Right? If it's terrestrial, where you're looking at number of individuals in a you know, square mile or square kilometer, that sort of thing. Volume, number of, say, a fish, uh, and uh, number per hectare. Okay? Uh, some volume of water. For example, so large mouth, large mouth bass per square kilometer, big area of water uh, of a lake, for example, or number of oak trees in the square kilometer of a forest. Actually, it's a cubic kilometer of water, right, to volume. Uh, square kilometers, that's an area of a forest. You can go out and count the trees. Or if you're looking at something small like nematodes, <clears throat> excuse me, number of nematodes in a cubic meter of soil. Right? And this is data here that's just showing over a series of years, population density changes, fluctuations over time, a uh, number per hectare. Okay, so that's going to be um, an area. So this is just showing changes in population density. So how do we measure population density? It sounds simple, right? Just go out and count the number of uh, jaguars. However, jaguars are very shy and reclusive and they don't want to interact with humans. Um, so they're not easy to count. Uh, counting the number of fish in a particular area, uh, it's basically impossible to catch all of them so uh, estimating population densities is one of the tools that's used. So it's impractical or impossible to count all individuals in a population. Uh, for one, it's very time consuming to try to capture and count or count all the individuals. Uh, again, most animals uh, tend not to be one, well, tend not to want to interact with humans or they're shy or they're hard to find. Think of aquatic animals, like how many whales are in the ocean of a particular species. It's essentially impossible to count them all. Um, and plants, even though they're stationary, can you imagine counting the individual uh, uh, grasses in a particular area? It simply takes too long to count them all. It's not practical. So ecologists use sampling techniques to estimate population densities. Uh, and the sampling techniques are based on the organism in question. If you're looking at grasses in an area, you plot out a certain uh, area, like a square yard. Sorry, a, yeah, a square yard in one area, and then you count the number of individuals in a square yard in another area, and then maybe in a third area, and then you would extrapolate to the entire area to get an estimate. And sometimes, sometimes that's the best thing you can do. With mobile organisms, you can capture, tag them, and release. And then by recapturing fish and by uh, looking at the numbers of recaptures, tagged fish or birds or goats, uh, you can get an estimate of the population number. So sometimes that's the best thing that you can do. Almost always is get an estimate. And depending on the method of sampling, the estimates can be pretty good. So uh, sometimes uh, population densities are estimated by indicators that aren't even the organism. So for example, you can count the number of bird nests to get an estimate of the number of birds. You're not actually counting the birds, but you're counting like a, a habitat feature of them, their nests or rodent burrows. Uh, the number of rodent burrows is indicative of the number of rodents, right? Uh, bird droppings sometimes, footprints of uh, the cougars, for example, rather than counting the individual organisms, especially if they're hard to find, hard to see, hard to capture, hard to count. So population estimates are very common. In fact, almost all biologists, ecologists do estimated population counts. So age structure is important in organisms. So the age structure of a population is the distribution of individuals or proportion of individuals in different age groups. So if we're looking at a particular bird, it looks like a finch, and um, you can, through 
capturing and estimating the numbers, you can see how many are, say, one year old. So this is just sample data. There are relatively no two to three year old birds. There's a fairly large number of four year old birds. And the numbers kind of dwindle as you get up to 11 year old birds, which is pretty old for a bird. Um, so the population structure, age structure of a population gives you a sense of how that population might be doing in the, in the environment, how uh, its numbers may change. So for example, for a bird population that has an age structure with a lot of four and five year old birds, these are breeding age birds, so the population probably is uh, healthy, uh, producing a fair number of young. You can see one-year-olds, the numbers are okay. It looks like there's some death in the two to three-year-olds, but once they survive to say the four-year-olds, then their survival is pretty good over time. So this age structure is dependent on the species, but it gives biologists a sense of the population dynamics how the numbers might be changing over time. So the age structure provides again insight into the history of a population's survival, like a fair number of these birds survive to older age. Reproductive success, in this example, the reproductive success of this population of birds maybe is not great because there's not a lot of one year, one, two or three year old individuals. <clears throat> and then how the population might be relating to or changing based on environmental factors. Maybe if it was a drought two years ago, that could have limited the food supply, and the most vulnerable are some of the younger birds and maybe some of the older birds, and that might explain why there's relatively few one, two, and three-year-old birds in this particular population. Okay. So talking about life and death here, let's look at life tables and what are called, whoops, Cursors going nuts and survivorship curves. So life tables track survivorship, meaning the chance that an individual in a particular age group survives to reach the next age group. Okay. Uh, by the way, insurance companies make uh, many of these so that they know how much to charge you if you're getting life insurance, for example. So life tables, although, but also help to determine the most vulnerable stages in a life cycle. So for example, here's a life table for the US population in 2008. So if an individual was between zero and 10 years old, okay, they sampled 100,000 of those, number dying during that interview, interval, sorry, between zero and 10 year old, 833. So. Here's the important number or the data that's uh, obtained from a life table, the chance of surviving this interval. So if you're a zero to 10 year old, what's the chance of probability that you will survive to be at least 10, 11, 12 years old? 0.992%. So 99.2% uh, survival uh, percentage or chance to reach the next age group. That's pretty good. If someone's going to tell you, oh, you have a 99.2% chance of living to the next decade. Hey, I'll take that. Okay. If you're 10 to 20, notice that the survivorship actually is better, right? Your chance of reaching 20 year old is higher than when you were under 10 and your probability of reaching a 10 year old. And then notice it drops a little bit between the thirties and forties. And it drops a little bit more between 40s and 50s and a little bit more between 50s and 60s. But basically for humans in the United States, our um, survivorship is pretty good until we hit 60s to 70s. Then it drops a little bit, still not that low, 70s to 80s, it drops more. But notice the big drop here between 80s and 90s. If you're between 80 and 90 year old, there's a less than 50% chance that you'll reach to be at least 90 plus years, okay? So survivorship in the United States is pretty good until you get to be fairly old. Okay, we'll continue on the next section.